The effects of urbanization on the environment is a lesson plan developed by John Bentz and has been modified by Derek Smetzer. The content in this video focuses primarily on the detrimental increase of impervious surfaces on the growing urban environment. This video was made possible through the NSF-funded Photo Knowledge in the Science Classroom Project at Ohio University. Have you ever witnessed a garden move in the middle of a city? How about a building coated in grass or a putting green on top of a building? Why would we ever plant a garden on the top of a roof? What is this madness? These tokenized structures are known as green roofs, and they can greatly reduce the impact of human activity on the environment. A green roof is essentially a garden planted on the top of a building or urban structure. Instead of using typical roofing materials, green roofs are composed of a series of layers, including a vegetation and soil layer and and synthetic plastic liners underneath the vegetation for drainage, filtration, and insulation purposes. These roofs enhance environmental conditions in urban environments by reducing runoff volumes from rain events, helping to filter contaminants in rainwater, providing insulation from noise, absorbing excess heat, increasing the lifespan of roof structures, and being generally pleasant to look at. However, they are more expensive than a traditional roof, as they require additional building materials, engineering, and maintenance. This augmentation of the urban landscape with greenery is a common technique to reduce the effects of urbanization on our environments. Urbanization relates to the growth and development of cities, but why might people be more inclined to move to urban areas? In the past and today, people flock to cities in hopes of economic opportunity. A majority of the U.S. population now resides in an urban environment. Cities provide a wealth of resources and a sense of opportunity which is lacking in rural areas. This growth of urban centers is largely accelerated by gains in transportation planning, where personal vehicles and roadways allow for quick movement of people and resources. Better transportation systems may ultimately lead to what is known as urban sprawl. People are now able to commute to cities in personal vehicles, and they are therefore able to reside outside of urban centers while still reaping the benefits of urbanization. Urban sprawl can be defined as the growth of low-density developments on the edges of cities and towns. These developments include things like suburbs and small towns outside of larger cities. Urban sprawl may eliminate usable agricultural lands result in increased impervious surfaces, worsen traffic congestion, increase greenhouse gas emissions, increase the number of people living in suburbs, and destroy wildlife habitats. A large concern of urban sprawl on the environment deals with the interruption of the local hydrological cycle by impervious surfaces. Impervious is defined as not allowing entrance or passage, something which is impenetrable. Of the three th surfaces shown, which ones are impervious, and which ones are pervious? How do these surfaces relate to urbanization? Take a moment to think about these questions, and share your thoughts with others in your class. Try to think of other surfaces or, or materials which are impervious. You may pause the video here to discuss. Of these images, the pavement and roof shingles would be considered as impervious surfaces, and the grass would be considered as a pervious surface. If you've ever observed the street during a large rain event, next to the curb you might notice rainwater flowing downhill in a little stream channel. In a natural environment with lots of pervious surfaces, water is able to penetrate through the ground and collect in aquifers underground. We will now conduct a simple lab experiment to study the effects of impervious surfaces on the environment. You will work in small groups to build a land surface model using a sloped paint tray, wire mesh, and sponges as shown in the picture on the right. Then, you will test several different materials by simulating a rain event. While conducting the experiment, try to think about what each material might represent in either an urban or natural environment. Read the associated handout for more details. Now you can pause the video here to perform the experiment before moving on with the rest of this video. 
An increase in the amount of impervious surfaces leads to increased amounts of runoff. Runoff is water from rain events flowing over the ground, eventually collecting into streams, rivers, or groundwater surfaces. In an urban environment, runoff volumes are increased dramatically because water is not as able to be stored underground. This leads to an increased risk of flooding in urban environments. The local hydrology of an urban environment is effectively driven by runoff, whereas a natural environment is driven by infiltration of rainwater into the grounds. A runoff-driven environment is more susceptible to water pollution. When water in an urban environment runs over impervious surfaces, it tends to pick up the pollutants which have been deposited by the people living there. To some degree, gasoline, oil, lawn fertilizers, pesticides, and trash all get swept away by runoff and carried to the intercepting streams or water sources. Without a sizable amount of land cover for water to penetrate through, these pollutants are not able to be effectively removed by natural filtration and thus become concentrated. The effects of water pollution may become intensified by air pollution as the two are interrelated to some degree. Eutrophication is a prime example of the pollution of aquatic ecosystems stemming from urban water runoff. Eutrophication begins when runoff picks up excess nutrients from the deliberate spraying of fertilizers for agriculture or personal lawns and gardens. Fertilizers are rich in phosphorus and nitrogen. By supplying plants with these nutrients, fertilizers allow for rapid plant growth. As you may expect, these nutrients bolster the growth of algae in the same way. Nutrient loading to streams via runoff accelerates the growth of algae, which can then block sunlight from reaching other aquatic organisms. When the algae eventually die and deposit on the bottom of a river or a lake, bacteria which decompose the dead algae remove oxygen from the water column and effectively kill organisms which rely on oxygen to survive. This leads to dead zones where aquatic organisms are not as able to thrive. In order to mitigate or reduce the negative effects of urban runoff in aquatic ecosystems, it is necessary to make a compromise with Mother Nature. To do this, engineers and construction companies typically imp implement mitigation features into infrastructure design. Mitigation efforts may include things like utilizing solar or renewable energy resources, repurposing municipal waste, incorporating urban gardens or green roofs into new and pre-existing infrastructure, using zoning to protect the agricultural landscape from urbanization, and allotting tax breaks for implementing environmentally conscious practices. An example of a common mitigation practice that you may be somewhat familiar with is the stormwater detention basin. These basins are sometimes a requirement for businesses or developers in rural areas. Stormwater de detention basins are tied to the downspouts of a building structure and reduce runoff volumes in a similar manner to green roofs by holding rainwater in a pond-like structure and all slowly allowing it to infiltrate into the ground. Typically, these basins are designed to collect and hold all potential rain rainwater runoff that results from the development of a building site. LEAD, or the Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, is a nationally recognized green certification organization under the United States Green Building Council, which uses a 110-point scale to determine how green a building is. Points are assigned to buildings based on several categories. These categories include whether the building uses water efficiently, is located at a sustainable site, is energy efficient, produces few emissions, uses environmentally conscious materials or resources in its construction, and has good indoor environmental quality. Buildings with the highest ratings receive a platinum rating. While lead design is not enforced at this time, it is slowly gaining a foothold in the minds of engineers, architects, and construction companies in the design of buildings and structures. A good example of a platinum rated building is station number 12 in Madison, Wisconsin. This building utilizes a geothermal system for heating and cooling, a green roof, solar heating panels for hot water needs, xeriscaping that reduces the amount of high maintenance turf in the landscaping, 
and a stormwater collection system for general non-potable uses, such as for landscape irrigation and flushing toilets. To summarize, urbanization and urban sprawl negatively impact the environment in a number of different ways. Because of the large percentage of impervious surface cover in urban environments, rainwater runoff volumes to streams tend to increase and may lead to dramatic consequences like flooding. Pollution associated with urban landscapes enters the aquatic environment through runoff into streams, lakes, and rivers. Eutrophication is an example of aquatic ecosystem collapse due to runoff of excessive nutrients from fertilizers for our lawns and gardens. We can use green roofs, urban gardens, improved storm water detention structures, and environmentally conscious designs, like lead buildings, to mitigate the impact of urban runoff on our environments.